Welcome to On Health with Houston Methodist. I'm Zach Moore. I'm a photographer and editor here, and I've worked in multimedia and television for over 15 years, and I'm also a longtime podcaster. I'm Todd Ackerman. I'm a writer-editor who previously covered science and medicine for the Houston Chronicle. And Todd, dementia can be a scary word, right? Well, it certainly is to me. I would say it's uh, my number one fear among health ailments as I get older. Really? Yeah. You know, a lot of these topics that we cover, I, I'm kind of a killjoy saying, well, I've never really experienced this. But for this one, uh, both my parents had dementia. Okay. I don't really have a family history of, of say, cancer. So that's kind of uh, my most feared disease. Presumably when they were older, they developed dementia? Yeah. I mean, they, they had a good run. They made it to 92, um, mm-hmm. and it was very late stage development. I watched firsthand as, as in when, when they both hit about 90, um, they started to lose it. And uh, it was tough, tough for them and, and tough caring for them as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you think about all the potential health problems you can encounter throughout your life, and especially getting older, dementia is especially concerning because you kind of lose who you are, right? Yeah, exactly. To me, like, your memories are who you are. Uh, my dad, before he got it, I never heard him say this, but my brother told me, he said it he used to describe uh, Alzheimer's as uh, living death. Mm. And it seems to me a fairly apt description of it. Yeah, my grandfather lived in 92 and started to develop like early stage dementia, but but almost, and you know, we'll talk about how this all works in our podcast today, but you know, it was more of a side effect of him just getting older. You know, it wasn't like a dementia diagnosis per se. So he had some of the, the side effects of like, he never forgot who he was or anything like that. But, you know, getting these loops of repeating the same thing over again, asking what, what day it is, or if we'd be watching some sports game, Hey, what's the score? Stuff like that. Right. So, so those kind of low level, if that's even a terminology for dementia, but that's the extent of my personal experience with dementia, fortunately so far in my life. Yeah. That's not dissimilar from how it worked with, with my parents, my dad was doing great, and then we brought him to his doctor saying we were concerned about some memory issues and behavior issues, and he gave them the oral test they give. He did great on it except for anything time-related. He had mm. no concept of time whatsoever. So the doctor told us he, it was just age-related decline, but then he gave him Aricept, which is the dementia, the Alzheimer's drug, uh-huh. and my dad kind of held steady for a year. And then he went downhill kind of fast and, and was pretty clearly Alzheimer's symptoms at that point. Mm-hmm. So my mom was, was kind of similar. Uh, she was in pretty good health until like when she was 82, she got shingles and never got over it. She died howling in pain from shingles, oh. but she was pretty much bedridden because of it. She was on painkillers for it and they kind of knocked her out. And so her, her heart declined. Both my parents were in, in heart failure um, or had heart failure. By the end, were in heart failure. I always thought that their dementia was kind of caused by poor blood flow, mm-hmm. which uh, we'll be talking about during the podcast. Well, thanks for sharing that, Todd. I can understand hearing that, why dementia would be such a great health concern of yours and why you'd want to learn more about it. Yeah, I, I would say I have a pretty keen interest at this point in dementia prevention. I uh, read anything I can on the subject and try to do whatever I can. I certainly uh, uh, exercise and and healthy eating are the first things people mention, but I'm always interested if there's anything else that might give me an edge. And to that end, who did we talk to today, Todd, about dementia? We talked to Dr. Gustavo Roman, who's a Houston Methodist neurologist who specializes in memory problems, Alzheimer's disease, other forms of dementia. Unlike some people, he does not shy away from the term dementia prevention. Mm. And he gave me some papers of his where he used the term dementia prevention in the title. Is that a terminology that people shy away from? Well, I think there's some some view that, you know, a lot of it is just so genetic. Uh, if you're programmed to get it, there's not a lot you can do. So we're here with uh, Dr. Roman. Dr. Roman, good to have you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, we're here to talk about dementia and, and dementia prevention, what people can do to reduce their risk. First of all, what are the numbers of people with dementia these days? How deep into this tsunami I've been reading about for the past 15 years or so, where are we with that? It's becoming a bigger and bigger problem. The, the, the name tsunami, I think, tells us very clearly what, what it is. 
Uh, here we have a clinic that is dedicated to see only patients with memory problems and problems with, with dementia. And uh, the, the appointments uh, keep getting longer and longer, the waiting time because of the increase in the number of cases. And this is uh, probably the, the result of what has been called the, the gray hair uh, uh, laws that uh, you see an increase in the number of people over the age of 65. It is said that uh, one of every 10 people over the age of 65 is going to develop dementia. And uh, the figures that are given by the uh, Alzheimer's Association indicate probably there are 6 million people with Alzheimer's disease in the United States. It doesn't sound like too much, but it's the combined population of uh, Houston, San Antonio, and Dallas. So 6 million is a, is a fairly large number. And the problem is that the number of cases of uh, dementia tends to increase as you get older. So by the age of 85, uh, you may have one out of three patients developing dementia. So aging is uh, the main risk factor for this, and the population, again, is increasing. The fastest group of age in the United States are the 85 and older. So that explains why is it that we see so many patients complaining of the memory difficulties and the problems with dementia. To cut to the chase here, can, can people prevent dementia or is it in your genes? You're just unlucky. It's your family history and, and there's not a lot you can do about it in those cases. I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, there is a contribution from the genes, from the family history. In most situations where either mother or grandmother or someone in the family had Alzheimer's disease, we don't have a, a clear gene that is sort of a, if you get the gene, you're going to get it. These are increase the risk by 10, 15 percent. So if you have a, a gene, especially the one called APOE, you increase the, the risk of developing dementia. So you need to be careful in trying to plan of how you can beat the uh, inheritance that you have. But in the large majority of cases that we see here, there is either no family history or the family history is so remote that you cannot really uh, blame that for the development of the disease. So there must be a, a number of environmental factors, what, what is called the, uh, the genes that are influencing the expression of, of, of genes. This is something that the oncologists discovered many years ago for the treatment of cancer, that giving a antivitamins, for instance, you can control the expression of those genes. It's called the, uh, uh, especially with the folic acid, you can prevent the expression of the genes that are going to produce cancer. So we are looking in the same direction, trying to decide uh, what are the products that can actually limit the factors that lead to the development of dementia. You mentioned that it's 1 in 10 at, what, 65? At age 65. At 85, it's, it's 1 in 1 in one 3. three. If you live long enough, is it almost inevitable that you'll get either Alzheimer's or, or some significant cognitive impairment? Yes, indeed. That's a very good point, because when you look at the brains of uh, centenarians, for instance, people who may or not may not have been uh, having any cognitive problems, the changes in the brain are those of uh, Alzheimer's disease, so development, uh, uh, accumulation of beta amyloid and tau uh, proteins, neurofibrillary tangles that are the changes that you see in Alzheimer's disease. The, the difference then is that those changes were not uh, sufficient to produce uh, dementia. So from the morphological viewpoint, if you look at uh, the brains, there are changes that tell you that, yes, somehow this is linked to, to aging and it's going to be manifested. And the things that, in a way, protect you from that include, in the first place, what is called uh, the cognitive uh, reserve. Uh, and that cognitive reserves is, in a way, 
that if you have been building connections in the brain from learning another language, from studying a particular area, when you do that, you are increasing the connectivity of the brain. So if you have uh, a good cognitive reserve, you have built in your brain enough connections that you can spare a few without going into, into dementia. And this is part of the plan to try to prevent uh, dementia from being expressed in, in, in real life. So before we get to what people can do, let, let's define our terms a little bit here. Dementia is an umbrella term for a number of, of different degenerative brain disorders? Yes. Uh, dementia comes from, from the Latin, that means no mind. Or, so when you tell someone that grandpa is out of his mind, uh, that's that's the correct definition. You have lost the mind that is uh, the product of the function of the brain. So that uh, grandpa who used to be a very gentle person, very nice with the family, all of a sudden becomes uh, more angry, more agitated, doesn't recognize the, the family, cannot find out the right words when he's talking. And he seems to be repeating the same questions over and over. And then he starts losing the capacity to take a shower, to brush his teeth, to control bladder and bowel. Then it's a different person. So it's out of his mind. And that's what the word dementia means. D without a mentis is uh, the mind. Is vascular dementia the one you can most reduce the risk of? Oh, yes, indeed. The vascular dementia can be treated essentially because of the advances in, in uh, cardiology and uh, endocrinology. If you are able to control, to diagnose early and control your blood pressure, you, you are ahead of the game. That, that certainly protects the brain from having the, the problems of multiple little strokes re related to uh, high blood pressure. And, and there are a large number of medications that are extremely efficient for the treatment of hypertension. We also know that avoiding too much salt in the diet is a factor that helps you control the blood pressure. The same is true for high cholesterol. In particular, we are recommending the Mediterranean diet with plenty of fish and uh, seafood, fruits and vegetables is quite helpful in lowering the, the levels of uh, the bad cholesterol, the low density cholesterol that can contribute to blockage of the arteries, including arteries in the brain producing uh, strokes and, and problems with, with uh, cognition. We have also found that the lack of vitamins in the B group increases an amino acid uh, that is very damaging to the blood vessels, increases the risk of heart attacks and increases the risk of um, uh, stroke. And in that way, by giving the appropriate B group vitamins, you can lower that factor and decrease the risk of, of the vascular component of, of dementia. But you're right, the, from the vascular component, uh, there is really no excuse for not being able to treat this, these major conditions. Are, are there lots of people with some sort of cognitive impairment that fall short of those, those categories? You, you can see the person is affected, but, but they don't really fit a diagnosis yet? Yes, indeed. And uh, that's uh, uh, before you get to the definition of dementia, where in, in, in clinical terms, you tell that the person has dementia when the person loses the independence, needs help to get pills, to uh, get dressed, can no longer drive. So the loss of independence secondary to Alzheimer's disease or one of the other dementias is sort of the frontier. From that point on, you're dependent, and that is uh, dementia. Before that, we talk about mild cognitive impairment. And it comes in, in, in many categories. Uh, the most frequent one is, of course, the short-term memory deficit. The patient who uh, keeps asking the same questions, uh, who is uh, told once and twice and three times and five times that, uh, no, we are not going to go to the supermarket today. So this uh, short-term memory 
is not enough to get the patient incapacitated or dependent on the, on the family. So he has mild cognitive impairment or MCI, and that's the category that we're, uh, we essentially would like to see the patients because things are just beginning, and at that time we can see what are the risk factors that can prevent going from MCI to dementia. How much age-related mental decline is, is to be expected? You know, you, I think of athletes and how they start losing their abilities around 35. They'd be by 50, they'd be a shadow of themselves. Is, is that same, same sort of thing going on with the brain? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, we all go through the problems of uh, finding where did I put this thing or uh, going from one place to the other and say, what the heck am I doing here? I don't remember that you go back and say, oh, now I remember. There are difficulties also with uh, verbal expression, uh, the difficulty with what we call word finding difficulties. Trying to find the right word is in the tip of my tongue. Trying to remember the last name of a person that you just met. They say, I had it in the tip of the tongue. Th those are uh, problems associated with aging. And in a way, they are more related to the uh, blood vessel problems that in a way affect the areas of the brain that work as the highways that connect one part of the brain to the other. This is called the white matter. You have on the outside the, the gray matter, the convolutions of the brain, and all the gray matter that is affected by Alzheimer's disease is connected to different parts of the brain through these highways in the white matter. And when you have problems with high, arterial hypertension or little strokes, those are the areas that are affected. So instead of having a very fast highway that allows you to go from one place to the other and come up with the right name or the right explanation, you take a little longer to send the message in the right place. And one of the, the factors that we have not mentioned, but that is uh, quite important for hypertension, is a good night of sleep. People who snore, and more than snoring, who stop breathing and have what is called obstructive sleep apnea during sleep uh, are at a high risk of developing these white matter lesions because when you are not breathing at night, the brain triggers an alarm to say, hey guy, you got to breathe, take a deep breath. And since the door is closed here because the tongue falls back and blocks the airway, then the low oxygen essentially triggers an alarm. An alarm in the brain is adrenaline that gets your blood pressure and your pulse high and wakes you up. Not to the point to waking up and say, hello, how are you? But enough to go from deep sleep, the rapid eye movement or REM sleep, and during that time, the brain is really cleaning all the leftovers from the metabolism of the day. So if you don't have a good night of sleep because of sleep apnea, you're not having enough REM sleep to clean the brain, and you're having constant bursts of high blood pressure that are not good for the heart and, and the brain. So this is uh, becoming also a very important factor in the prevention of dementia from Alzheimer's disease. So can you give a kind of quick lay-friendly explanation of, of what exactly happens in Alzheimer's? I've read a lot of, uh, about the, the buildup of, of plaque in the brain, I guess tau it's called, and, and then the other thing I, I hear is that the brain shrinks. Are, are those both good ways to think about it? Yes, indeed. Again, we don't know what is it that triggers the, the, this uh, process, um, but aging is, a, is, is an easy way to to sort of summarize what is happening. And uh, what is happening is that the, the brains, especially the uh, neurons in the gray matter, in the cortex of the brain, those are the ones that build these connections when you are learning something. Uh, those connections are, are, are lost. And then the brain is also depositing uh, abnormal proteins. Uh, the, the, the most frequent one is uh, beta amyloid, and that's the one that has been uh, targeted by the pharmaceutical industry, uh, the two new products that 
we mentioned that have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration remove the amyloid from, from the brain. Although until now, without any major effects in improving cognition and so on. And the reason for that may be that the second component, which is the tau protein that produces sort of changes in the uh, structure of the, of the brain, is called neurofibrillary tangles. Those changes end up disconnecting the neurons. So all this connectivity in the brain, all these connections that you build with so much difficulty during uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, college, all these connections in the brain tend to disappear. When that happens, then the brain begins to shrink because these neurons actually die. They disappear. And as the number of, of uh, bodies in the, in the gray matter disappears, then there is a shrinking of, of the brain. That shrinkage of the, of the brain is compensated in part by increasing the amount of fluid in the brain, of water. And that can lead to another form of dementia called normal pressure hydrocephalus, or NPH, which is one of the few forms of dementia that we can treat effectively with the help of neurosurgeons and other treatment. So dementia is a, is a process in which the symptoms are only exhibited, say, 20 years after the process starts, right? Absolutely. Are, are, there, are there brain tests a seemingly healthy person can take to, to learn if he or she is on that path? There is a, a strong uh, development trying to measure in the, in the blood uh, the levels of beta amyloid and tau protein. In that way, you could, years ahead of the, of the game, you can make a diagnosis just with a, with a blood test. But we are still far away from, from that goal. So, right. And how about scans? PET scans are quite useful. PET stands for positron emission tomography. So in that case, uh, they uh, have to inject in, uh, intravenously uh, sugar, glucose, that is tagged with an isotope of fluoride. And uh, the brain uses the sugar to produce energy. So you can actually map what parts of the brain are using the glucose, the sugar, in the appropriate way, and what parts are lagging behind and not, they have what is called the hypometabolism, they, the amount of uh, energy that is being produced by this uh, sugar in the brain is limited to some areas that are the ones that have to do with uh, memory, for instance, or with language in the case of the frontotemporal dementias, or uh, in some cases, visual loss. Patients who start having difficulty with vision and they go from one pair of glasses to the other and nothing works. So finally, someone said, well, maybe the problem is not in the eyes, could be in the centers of the brain that analyze the vision. And that is uh, uh, something that the PET scan can uh, diagnose with accuracy. There are also, and we are beginning to develop tests that measure how much amyloid is deposited in the brain and how much of the tau protein is present. So yes, we can do the, the imaging. The only problem is that these are quite expensive tests and the insurance companies in general are reluctant to do that unless the patient has a confirmed diagnosis of one of these forms of dementia, frontotemporal or Lewy body or Alzheimer's disease. Are many people typically taking those tests pre-symptoms? Very little, unless you're part of a of a study, uh, the tests are not, not done. Should that change, do you think? Hopefully it will change. But what we do have is the neuropsychology testing, and those are quite good. There are a number of tests that you can do that check uh, your capacity or the parts of the brain that are responsible for different functions. For instance, one of the most popular tests is the, the clock test. They tell you, please draw a clock big circle, put all the numbers on the face of the clock, and then put the hand so that it reads, whatever, uh, 11.45. And uh, that simple test actually is checking how is the frontal part of the brain that is in charge of what is called executive function. This is sort of the board of directors of the brain that tells you how you drive your car, how you get dressed, how do you you take care of uh, cooking. All these things 
have been learned and they are controlled by this frontal part of the brain. And that's why uh, people who have the frontal temporal dementias have so much difficulty with, with life. They, they lose control of, of these functions that are normally quite, uh, uh, you don't think about that because the board of directors in the brain, the, the frontal part, is in charge of the executive function and that usually is quite effective in keeping you uh, active and doing the things that you learn without difficulty. Dementia is not a specific diagnosis on its own. Rather, it's a general term for any severe decline in mental abilities due to the brain's physical deterioration. Here are the four most common types. Alzheimer's disease. The most common type of dementia, Alzheimer's is diagnosed every 67 seconds, according to the Alzheimer's Association. A progressive disease that leads to broken connections between nerve cells and tissue shrinkage in parts of the brain, it is the country's sixth leading cause of death. Former President Ronald Reagan drew attention to the disease in 1994, five years after leaving office, when he announced in a letter to the American people that he'd been diagnosed. Vascular Dementia Probably the second most common variety of dementia, vascular dementia is caused by reduced blood to the brain, often the result of many strokes. Symptoms vary depending on what brain region is affected, but many include short-term memory problems, getting lost in familiar areas, inappropriate laughter or crying, trouble following instructions, difficulty concentrating, lack of bowel or bladder control, and hallucinations. Considered underdiagnosed, it's thought to account for 15 to 25% of all dementia cases. Lewy body dementia. Considered the third most common dementia, Lewy body involves protein deposits developing in nerve cells in the brain regions involved in thinking, memory, and motor function. Characterized by hallucinations and trembling, in addition to symptoms like memory loss, it can be confused for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, or combined with it. The late actor Robin Williams was diagnosed with Parkinson's a few months before his 2014 suicide, then with Louis Body following an autopsy on his brain. Frontotemporal Dementia The least common of the four main dementia types, frontotemporal disorders are the result of damage to neurons in the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain, regions key to maintaining skills related to memory, language, judgment, problem solving, and behavioral and emotional regulation. Last year, after Bruce Willis was diagnosed with the condition, not long after his family announced he had aphasia, a disorder that affects the ability to communicate. Frontotemporal dementia is a progression of that condition. We'll have more with Dr. Rahman after the break. From annual checkups to managing chronic conditions, your health care should be personalized to you. At Houston Methodist, our primary care doctors provide customized care for you and your family with more than 40 convenient locations across greater Houston. We offer a variety of ways to get care, from in-person and virtual appointments to same-day visits when you're sick. Choose your doctor and schedule online at HoustonMethodist.org slash stay healthy. Houston Methodist, leading medicine. Now, back to our conversation with Dr. Rahman. So when, when's an appropriate time for people to start thinking about what they can do to reduce their risk? I, I know the answer is probably it's never too early to start, but realistically, I doubt people in their 20s, 30s, 40s are really thinking about that. But how about, say, people in their 50s, they're, they're in good health, they feel mentally sharp, but they just saw their parents diagnosed with a dementia or they're exhibiting some sort of cognitive decline, should those people start saying, hey, what can I do so that I don't go down that path? I, absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right. Especially when, when the disease kind of touches uh, very close to where you are. Even if you're in your 40s, I think it's a good idea to make sure that you check your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your vitamins, and uh, that you do some of these uh, very simple cognitive tests that are available well, on your cell phone. And if something is not looking good, then you check with your primary care physician, with your family doctor, 
who will decide if there is a need for for uh, either replacement of the vitamins, could be as simple as that, or adjusting your blood pressure medication, or making sure that you don't have uh, obstructive sleep apnea, because these are things that can be treated and that are quite effective in preventing the progression of a gene from neurodegeneration. Are you pretty familiar with the sort of category I mentioned? Somebody in their 50s who's seemingly in good health, feels mentally sharp, but they see their parents get diagnosed or exhibiting symptoms and they wonder what they can do. Do you, do you hear that a lot from people? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Yeah. And and again, that uh, that's part of the reason why we, we are having this conversation today, that people need to learn that uh, there is a, a number of things that you can do to either slow down or even uh, to really halt the progression of, of these conditions. But you need to do it early enough. So uh, by all means, yes, indeed. And and uh, in general, the general practitioners, the family practice are, are quite aware of the things that you need to look for uh, in someone who has this history or of that perhaps inheriting a, a gene that has been associated with Alzheimer's disease. I assume most all of your patients are people that either have dementia or they're coming in concerned about it because a, f a family member has noticed a change or something. Are, are the latter group that are just starting to e exhibit symptoms, are those the candidates for, yes, for prevention they, strategy? They, they, are, they are beginning to, uh, I think the, the population in general is beginning to realize that uh, you don't have to wait until you're totally incompetent to be able to be treated for these problems. So uh, we are seeing a larger number of patients, and that also uh, has been a, a blessing in the sense that now we have people with very early forms of mild cognitive impairment, as I mentioned, who are at risk of progressing to Alzheimer's disease, who are willing to participate, who are candidates who meet the criteria for uh, uh, this mild cognitive impairment and early treatment of, of these conditions, yes. So this seems like a good time to segue into, you know, what the risk factors are and, and what people can do. Let's start with risk factors. Uh, besides aging and, and family history, what, what are risk factors? We have been uh, mentioning the vascular risk factors. Those are certainly uh, very important. Hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemias, uh, problems with cholesterol, problems with cardiac arrhythmias, uh, history of uh, heart attacks. All those are risk factors that essentially increase the, the, the risk of, of uh, worsening the mild cognitive impairment getting into, into dementia. Gender is a, a risk factor? Women get in it this, more than men? In the sense that women are more affected than, than men, and that's one of the mysteries. We don't know why. Usually, uh, women uh, outlive men in general in the population, but uh, they are uh, at high risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So, something with the hormones and some of the of the trials for uh, the use of uh, hormones post menopause uh, found that some of those hormones actually were associated with increasing the risk or speeding up of these cognitive declines. So uh, the, there has been, a, in a way, a tendency to stay away from uh, female hormones postmenopausal uh, because of the, of the increased risk of vascular lesions and, and of course, uh, increased risk of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And uh, smoking and, and more than moderate drinking? Uh, smoking certainly is a, is a risk factor, uh, in part because uh, of the effects that the smoke will have on the lining of the blood vessels. So uh, people who smoke tend to have problems with occlusion of the femoral arteries. They have intermittent claudication. They cannot walk uh, because of the deposit of uh, cholesterol in the in the large arteries, but the same thing happened in the in the brain. So, uh, smoking certainly is a is a big one. It's a it's a major risk factor. And uh, nowadays, uh, people 
tend to realize that it's perhaps not a not a good idea. Uh, in terms of, of alcohol, um, I, I tell the patients when they say, well, I just have a, maybe a little glass of uh, scotch or something at the end of the day to relax. Um, there are some days where I don't drink anything. Or I'll have a glass of uh, Chardonnay or red wine uh, with dinner. I think I uh, learned that in Europe they do that every day with breakfast, lunch, and supper. So I think it's probably a good uh, idea. It's good for, for your brain and so on. Well, I tell them that uh, you probably heard that people drink to forget. Well, it works. So alcohol and memory uh, don't don't get along too well, uh, not only because of this uh, increased uh, consumption of the thiamine, the vitamin B1 that uh, can produce a, a dramatic loss of, of memory and produce the dementia, but also because one of the things that usually happens is that since your memory is not that good, you really don't know if you had a glass of wine or not, and by the end of the day, uh, half a bottle is gone, and uh, you find yourself consuming more alcohol and more wine uh, than than usual. So I usually advise the patients in, with mild cognitive impairment to avoid alcohol completely if they can do it. So it's a, it's a very controversial area. Some of the studies that were done in Europe demonstrated that uh, drinking just a glass of wine with, the, with breakfast and not breakfast, but with lunch and supper had some positive effects in, in, in memory, preventing the age-associated cognitive decline. Uh, obesity? Absolutely. And uh, then we, we get into the problem that is a, a significant problem in, uh, here in the United States, which is the problem of, uh, of obesity not only it increases in a, in a major way the risk of developing uh, diabetes. You have what, what is called insulin resistance in people who gain an, in, an increased amount of weight, but also it means that you're not doing your exercises, that you are very sedentary, and also that you increase the risk of developing obstructive sleep apnea with all the consequences that it has on preventing you from the good part of sleep. So in a way, a good night of sleep is a, is a factor that decreases the risk of, of developing Alzheimer's. I read that research has, has suggested about 40% of Alzheimer's cases may be preventable based on modifiable risk factors. Do you agree with that? Oh, certainly, yes. And, and the earlier you see them, the, the higher the percentage will be, of course, because uh, once you reach a certain point where there has been this major sort of devastation in the brain with shrinking and atrophy, and uh, then uh, there is very little you can do to regenerate those areas. It, again, it was very difficult in the first place to to create those connections, those synapses in the, term, uh, the uh, technical term, the synapses are the connection between the neurons and actually get enough of these circuits to learn uh, to speak a foreign language or to play an instrument. All these things take a lot of effort. So once they those areas are, are destroyed, they are not going to come back. Let's talk about things that you might emphasize. Are, are diet and exercise the first things? Yes, indeed, because uh, uh, you need to realize that uh, maybe the, the diet that, that you're having is not the safest for your brain health, but uh, the consumption of excessive amounts of uh, cholesterol is, is another point. If you survive on uh, hamburger and fries every day, uh, you are actually getting too much of these uh, of these fatty products. So it tends to produce uh, products that are not healthy for for the brain or for for the blood vessels. So uh, what we are recommending 
because of the experience from from trials where you actually look at the natural situation of people in, uh, uh, for instance, the seven uh, seven cities studies, compare the diet from Finland, Holland, with uh, Crete in Greece, uh, with Japan, and uh, there was an order of magnitude bigger number of cases of heart attacks and death in in these areas that consume a lot of uh, milk and meat compared with the diet in Greece or in Japan that uh, eats a lot of fish and uh, uh, very little in the, in the way of uh, red meat. Uh, they also tend to have a diet that relies on green leafy vegetables uh, and uh, in uh, Crete in Greece, who has the the record for the healthiest diet, uh, extra virgin olive oil certainly is a factor that seems to help control the bad cholesterol, and it has positive effects in prevention of diabetes and some cognitive effects that certainly uh, are, are quite important. So we are becoming fans of the Mediterranean diet. In uh, Texas, it's a little bit difficult because you're used to steak and potatoes. So more and more people are essentially learning that at least having uh, fish once a week is is a good thing for your health. The other thing that has been found is that if you eat more than three different types of fruits in a day, your risk of heart attacks and and, uh, dementia decreases significantly. Mm -hmm. And the same is true from the red color that you see in seafood, in uh, lobster, uh, they uh, feed on a uh, microorganism that produces uh, something called astaxanthin, which is probably the nature's strongest antioxidant that will help you uh, sort of fight the normal uh, excitatory problems that you get with uh, things in the environment, uh, the cars and uh, things in uh, chemicals in the in the air that you are exposed to. So uh, this uh, Mediterranean diet has uh, these, these factors. And then sort of counterintuitively, the best thing you can do for your uh, brain health is uh, physical activity, exercise? Yes, indeed, because uh, perfusion, the amount of blood going to the brain it's going to depend also on how active you you are. When you go out uh, walking fast for a couple of miles, when you go to work at the gym or do these anaerobic exercises, uh, you are actually stimulating also the circulation in the brain. This is also good for uh, once the body temperature increases with the exercise, that in itself is an anti oxidant function. You are uh, fighting uh, infections. You are fighting a a number of uh, these uh, uh, oxidative products that you are receiving during life here in the city or living close to the highway. All these things uh, certainly have been found to have a deleterious effect on, on, on cognitive function and can be improved with regular exercise. And again, you don't have to to be lifting a large amount of weight, but uh, walking, uh, stationary bike, uh, all these things are okay. You, if, if you like uh, to ride your bike or if you want to ride a horse, you need to put a helmet, of course, because head injuries are a cause of, of dementia and, and you may fall. And if you don't have the appropriate protection for the head, that is also a risk factor for uh, dementia. Brain puzzles, exercises, there's not a lot of evidence proving that they stave off dementia? Well, they they essentially help you uh, remain at the, the level you are. And it, it is important to do that uh, crossword puzzles and uh, all these games that you, that you find now in the, in the internet that are, that are quite good. The best push-ups for the brain actually include speaking a foreign language. Those are probably one of the best uh, exercises for the brain. There was a study done in Canada some years ago where they compare the cognitive decline with age, how, how well you do uh, 
as you grow old, when you speak just one language, either English in Canada or uh, French for the area of Montreal, the Quebec province, or when you compare that with people who were fully bilingual, who spoke English and French. Well, there was no no different, no, no, no game. The, the ones who were uh, bilingual were ahead of the game, but a major distance. So if you learn that any of those languages in when you were uh, in, in high school or college, one of the best ways you can do is start practicing that. Trying to speak, practicing a, a, another language is the best exercise we can get. The other exercise that is quite good for, for the brain is playing a musical instrument. You, uh, if you took uh, piano lessons when, when you were uh, early in life and you can still kind of read it but forgot how to do that, that's an excellent exercise because you are increasing the capacity of concentration. You're looking at the notes, you have to know what finger to use and what uh, is the sound that you should get. And you are constantly in this uh, sort of circuit that essentially increases your attention. So playing an instrument is also something that is quite helpful. The same is true for uh, doing some artistic things. I, I usually keep some of the, the art forms that my patients uh, have said, they, well, bring me the homework next time I see you. And they, they really do very good. And again, by the same reason, you're just looking at the shadows on the apple or whatever it is that you're drawing. And that increases the sense of attention. And it gives you the sense of creativity. You are accomplishing something that in a way takes you away from the fact that your short-term memory may not be that good. So those are the, the, the main areas that uh, are helpful to uh, work as push-ups for the brain, as we call that. And social engagement generally, I assume. Yes. During the during the this past uh, years with COVID, where we had, especially when we had the lockdowns and we had essentially no social interaction, it was really a, a major factor in causing deterioration in the patients. So, you actually saw that in your patients? Yes, of course. They, they had to stay home. They couldn't see anyone. The family couldn't visit. Uh, and uh, the, the, the decline was much more significant. So uh, social interaction is, is very important. We, we are social animals, and uh, many of my, my patients uh, keep... Uh, get into the group where they play bridge or they play poker. Or, those are good because you're enhancing your attention. You need to know what cards that you're given and what could be the, the other cards. So all those are really quite effective ways of enhancing your, your cognition. So I've read that being attentive to hearing issues is a big thing. If you, if you need a hearing aid, that's vitally important to prevent Alzheimer's. Can you t explain that to me a bit? It has been found that, indeed, hearing loss, of course, very common in our patients, is a major factor. The problem is that many of them are reluctant to use the hearing aids. It's also very common in uh, veterans, uh, especially the ones who saw action and were exposed to high noise from artillery and that sort of thing, or people who work in uh, uh, high noise environments, they tend to lose uh, hearing quite quite commonly. And uh, that essentially uh, can be controlled, of course, with the appropriate uh, hearing aids, but it's a major factor in the social interaction. They are essentially excluded from the conversations in a group because they just don't know what they are talking about, or when they say something it has nothing to do with what the topic of conversation was. So it is uh, it is very important. It's quite common. We see this very very often. And uh, now using the the, the face mask uh, in the clinic, the patients used to kind of be able to read and kind of learn what you were saying. But if your face is covered they just cannot uh, know what, what the conversation is all about.
So let, let's talk about uh, any vitamins or supplements you could take. You, you mentioned the, the B vitamins. Um, that's B6, 9, and 12? That's correct, yeah. The data that we have is, is, is fairly solid. This is the result of what is called a controlled clinical trial. What they did in England was to take people with a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment. They gave this group of vitamins in the B group, the B1, B6, B12, and folic acid. And uh, they let them sort of go home and take your medications. Uh, they, they were controls over time to make sure that they were indeed taking the medication or, or the placebo. And then uh, at the end of the trial, they repeated the PET scan to see how much of this lack of metabolism the brain was having from uh, the uh, development of what was considered to be the earliest form of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, the trial was very conclusive. People who were taking the vitamins compared with the ones that were taking just the placebo, that's the sugar pills, uh, had stopped the progression of, of the problems. The, the scores were the same uh, compared with the others who had continued to decline over the period of two years. And the decline was explained by the increase in the areas of the brain that were not able to use the, the sugar. So. Uh, they also measure a product called homocysteine, which is an, uh, an, amino, an amino acid, a sulfur containing. It has a group of sulfur that, that is uh, very nasty on the lining of the blood vessels and tends to produce uh, an increased risk of uh, coronary disease, of heart attacks, and, and strokes. So the homocysteine had decreased quite a bit in the ones who were taking these vitamins. So... The conclusion was that if you take uh, this group of vitamins early enough, you are able to slow down in a significant way, and sometimes you're able to really stop. You really can halt the progression of this Alzheimer's disease. And again, there is no other product until the, the recent ones that were approved, but this is something that is, uh, number one, inexpensive. Uh, you just need to take the right amount because uh, you can uh, get toxicity if you take too much uh, vitamin B6, for instance. The pyridoxine can produce uh, lesions. Or if you take too little because, uh, for, for instance, for vitamin B12, sometimes you cannot absorb the vitamin from the food. Uh, this is uh, associated with what is called pernicious anemia, that form of anemia that is linked to problems in the stomach that do not allow the vitamin B12 to be transported to your organism. It also happens in the elderly, the lack of vitamin B12, because uh, with years there is decrease in the amount of acid and bacteria tends to proliferate and to grow in the stomach. In some cases, we have to give B12 shots to the patient in order to sort of make sure that the appropriate levels of vitamin B12 are, are present. But by far, the, this group of, of vitamins uh, are the ones that have been shown to stop the progression of Alzheimer's by the mechanism of uh, lowering uh, the, uh, uh, this homocysteine that I was mentioning. But also, some of these vitamins can stop the expression of genes that produce uh, Alzheimer's disease, in the same way that the oncologists use some antivitamins to block the, the progression of, of the cancer. You block the gene expression. It doesn't matter if you, if you inherited the gene, but if you can keep it without not working, that essentially is what you can do with some of these vitamins in the B12. So would those B vitamins be something that uh, someone still healthy, not having any symptoms, might benefit from? Yes, yes, of course. Yes, of course, especially, as I mentioned, after a certain age, uh, after age 60 or 70, where the capacity of your body to take from the food the vitamin B12 and utilize that is decreasing. So you may need to give it a hand and take an extra pill, usually a sublingual tablet of a thousand micrograms of vitamin B12. So you put it under the tongue and it's absorbed very quickly. So these vitamins certainly are indicated as sort of the ben beneficial uh, vitamin supplements that you can take after a certain age.
Dr. Roman emphasizes the benefit B6, B9, and B12 may provide in preventing dementia, so we wondered if any other vitamins or supplements might have a protective function against age-related mental decline. Here's what he had to say. Vitamin C. There is some evidence vitamin C may be associated with a lower risk of cognitive decline. Dr. Roman suggests taking no more than one gram a day. Vitamin E. A few studies have found that vitamin E supplementation may be associated with decreased risk of cognitive decline. It has not demonstrated any effect on Alzheimer's in studies. Vitamin D. One recent large study found vitamin D supplementation was linked to a significantly lower incidence of dementia. Dr. Roman emphasizes exposure to vitamin D through the sun. Melatonin. Melatonin is currently being studied for possible cognitive benefits, but no verdict is in yet. Dr. Roman prescribes it for many patients for better sleep quality, which is associated with a lower risk of cognitive decline. Fish oil. There have been reports that fish oil, more in foods than supplements, may reduce the risk of developing dementia because of the possible blood flow benefits. However, there isn't very strong evidence at this point. Ginkgo biloba. The herb from China was once a big hope for its supposed mental benefits, but in clinical trials, ginkgo biloba failed to prevent cognitive decline or dementia. Resveratrol. The powerful compound in the skin of grapes was all the rage 15 years ago, thought to provide all manner of benefits, including cognitive ones. Though research continues, Dr. Oman says it appears more beneficial in mice than in humans. So how about research to, to develop medication to to prevent the buildup of some of these things that cause Alzheimer's, much like statins to, pre to prevent the buildup of arterial plaque. Is that going on much? That is becoming the target after the beta amyloid being the, the main target for, for the past 15 or 20 years. Uh, all the effort of the pharmaceutical industry was in trying to control the, the deposits of beta amyloid in the senile plaques in the, in the brain uh, to the point that uh, maybe 20, 23 years ago, uh, at first the vaccine against Alzheimer's was developed. Uh, they took the beta amyloid, they isolated that, and then produced a vaccine where your immune system will attack the beta amyloid in the brain, and that will be removed in, uh, in the blood vessels. Uh, it, it worked like a charm. You you get the vaccine, the amyloid disappear completely from the brain, but the immune reaction was so strong that the patients started having uh, hemorrhages in the brain, and uh, many of these patients died in the initial trial. So that was a, a no no. It was stopped completely. So uh, unfortunately, we still are not there in terms of being able to prevent the development of Alzheimer's disease. But now the effort is more towards Tau, Methodist has yes, some research yeah, there. We are, uh, we are conducting a, a trial using a, a product that you can find is approved by the Food and Drug Administration. It's, you can find it in uh, your health food stores. It's called L-Serine. It's an amino acid. It's part of the uh, sort of building blocks of the proteins that has been found in experimental animals of uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease and and uh, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, that it uh, prevents the deposition of this tau protein, which is the one that it really destroys the the, the neurons. So we hope that it's uh, it's going to be uh, positive. We are doing again a strictly controlled, um, placebo control uh, trial where the patients get these uh, gummy bears that contain the L-serine and the other group re uh, receives the placebo <clears throat> and uh, they have to go a PET scan at the beginning. That That is the best way to measure how much change is there in the, in the uh, brain from the beta amyloid and from the tau. And uh, uh, after six months, uh, they repeat the PET scan and they repeat the cognitive test, a series of comprehensive neuropsychology testing. And we hope that it will uh, give us a, the possibility of preventing 
the uh, the development of Alzheimer's disease with something less uh, traumatic than the, the products that are currently approved. I read so much about the the failure of drugs to to treat Alzheimer's. Is this a, an avenue preventing it that perhaps researchers should have gone down before more? Oh, yes, we, we, we hope so. Uh, there is even a, a book uh, on Alzheimer's disease and uh, describing how not to study a disease because somehow we got stuck with the amyloid and that, that became the central topic. Uh, for many years at the NIH, you would not get funded for a trial on Alzheimer's if amyloid was not mentioned. So the pharmaceutical industry has invested millions and millions of dollars in products to control the amyloid. But uh, maybe we're barking at the wrong tree. So the tau certainly is important in the sense that it correlates much better with the severity of the disease. Amyloid, you can have patients with severe Alzheimer's without amyloid. Uh, but if you correlate the degree of shrinking of the brain, the degree of atrophy, with the volume of tau protein, the correlation is very good. So early in the disease, you have tau that is deposited only under the temple, in the hippocampus, in the temporal region of the brain, and it progresses, invading finally the frontal areas, the executive function areas, and as the volume, as the number of these tau proteins increases, the degree of dementia also gets worse. So the correlation is with the tau, which destroys the neurons rather than with the amyloid. So maybe we're hoping that this process against uh, tau would also open the door to better prevention and prognosis for Alzheimer's disease. Are, are you hopeful that we'll have something? Very, very much so, yes. I, I'm, I'm the PI for this study on the Elserine. So far, patients are tolerating that quite well. And they're very enthusiastic. So I don't know which one is getting the active product or not, but uh, that's, a, that's a big hope that this will give us a, a chance to control the problem. Is there anything you want to add to leave listeners with about uh, dementia and what they can do to better their odds? Yes, I, I think the the message is that uh, uh, even though we don't have a cure yet, if you check with your doctor for early symptoms of uh, what we call mild cognitive impairment, memory loss, difficulty with word finding, difficulty in finding the right uh, uh, the right word for your uh, computer, difficulty with uh, balancing your checkbook, uh, difficulty with uh, cooking and learning the recipes. Uh, you have to tell your primary care physician that you're concerned, especially if there is a family history of someone developing dementia, either grandma or uh, brothers, older brothers and sisters. So, because the earlier you get attention, the better your future will be. All right, very good. I appreciate your taking time to talk with us. Thank Learned you very here. much for the invitation. Hearing this from Dr. Rahman, what are some key points that you're going to take home with you and try to apply in your quest to better understand and prevent dementia? Well, the one I've already started applying is one that our listeners won't have just heard because he only mentioned it to us uh, after the tape stopped rolling. That actually happens quite a bit. We start packing up and then yes, it our does. experts like, oh, hey, by the way, I'm like, yeah. well, <laughs> but we're sharing it here with you. Yes. So uh, what he mentioned was that one thing he is really big on as a possible preventative for dementia is extra virgin olive oil. Okay. Um, and not just cooking with it as much as possible, but he even said, like, it could not hurt to, like, take a tablespoon every day. So I have started doing that. You know, that is interesting timing because recently I've seen that coffee shops, certain coffee shops are offering drinks with olive oil in them, like as an additive, like, you know, a spoonful of sugar, some milk, maybe some olive oil. Now, olive oil is something I've never consumed outside of cooking materials or, you know, bread. <laughs> you know, at an Italian restaurant or something like that. And consuming it just by itself is not something that would have occurred to me, but, you know, doctor recommended. Yeah, I'm trying it. My previous experience was the same as yours, but I, I have noticed long before talking with Dr. Roman uh, how much it's considered a healthy ingredient 
it's one of the key components of a Mediterranean diet, um, and it's just touted generally for, for uh, health benefits. What time of day are you taking this spoonful of olive oil, Todd? You know, he, he suggested, I don't know if you, if you meant it strictly, but he suggested maybe in the morning. And with you being a night owl, as we've established on this podcast, Todd, that's probably like in the afternoon sometime when you get up, right? <laughs> that's huge, Zach, but no, I was, I was, <laughs> I'm up early enough that, <laughs> that the afternoon is the afternoon for me. No, but all jokes aside about, about sleep, though, we cover a wide variety of topics on this podcast, but there seems to be a lot of overlap between these health subjects, such as, such as sleep. You know, we've talked about sleep and getting enough and how sleep is not just this endless bank you can keep pulling from and, and sleeping four hours a night or three hours a night. And that stuff adds up over time. And you think about the short-term consequences of like, oh, I'm going to be tired and wiped out for the next couple of days, but I'll power on through. You do that enough, it could start leading to potentially the road to dementia. Yeah. Dr. Roman talked about how uh, just, for instance, as you get older and you get up to go to the bathroom a lot during the night, how detrimental that is to your sleep and, and thus your mental health. Mm-hmm. Now, then that is definitely something I have taken away from this because, you know, I think I'm like, oh, I got time. Don't worry about it. I, I can overcome, a, not that I do all-nighters anymore, but I can overcome this or overcome that. But no, long term, right? These things add up. So that's something I'm going to be very cognizant of moving forward. One thing he said that interested me was, uh, was the talk about brain puzzles, exercises. Mm. Do you do anything like that? Do you do like crossword puzzles, Wordle? I, I used to do crossword puzzles all the time, like in college, uh, because, you know, we didn't have smartphones then dating myself, right? But, and you had the, the newspaper, which I also wrote on, by the way, just side note. But, you know, I'd get my physical copy of the newspaper in college, read my article, flip it over, and then do the crossword. And your friends do them. And it's a fun thing. Were, were you good at crossword puzzles? Did I was you, very you, good at crossword puzzles. Do you do the New York Times crossword puzzle? Oh, you know, that's a challenging one. That's, yes. that's like the big leagues of crossword puzzles. So is, is that, do you do that every day? To keep your no, mind sharp? No, I'm terrible at crossword oh, okay. puzzles. Oh, okay. <laughs> How was the Chronicles crossword puzzle? How did that rank? Uh, well, it's not as difficult as the Times one, but I, I've never really done them because when I when I have in the past, I was bad at them. Okay. I did recently. Do you know the the jumble strip? It's like they give you mic- jumbled letters, and that you have to make the word out of it, and then there's a few key letters. I have seen this. Yes. Yes. So. I used to be not very good at those either, but I did that recently and, and did it much better. So maybe I'm in my, you know, verbal skills are improving or something. Interesting. See, I've always seen crossword puzzles as less of a mind game of like a trivia thing. Like, oh, I happen to know this or that so I can fill in these answers. But like when you look at like a Sudoku and other things like that, those are mental processes of finding patterns and things, right? Yeah. Yeah. That stuff's probably better. Yeah. Uh, I have not have not done that. No, I don't like math at all. So that has no interest to me. I think at some point I will try doing stuff like that, but I haven't got there yet. Yeah. And it kind of, it helps both sides of the brain really doing these, these mind exercises, right? Because there's the logical side, but there's the creative side, like, oh, well, this picture and this shape fits in with that. And that's what I like doing. It's, it's fulfilling, it's a fulfilling thing to do, you know, physical puzzles as well, right? Getting, we spend so much time on screens, right? It's nice to have that tactile and just using all the senses, right? Right. Yes. Well, I just hope it doesn't come too late for me. You know, last night I, uh, I filled my, late last night, I filled my car up with gasoline, put my wallet on the top of my car and proceeded to drive off with oh it. Oh my God, <laughs> last night? Yes. <laughs> so Did you go back and find it? I, I went back and uh, it was by then about 1230. Okay. Uh, and the, the night owl here. Go yeah, on. Right. Yeah. It was closed and I looked all over. It wasn't there. I went back. At 7 a.m. this morning, the gas station was open, but no one had turned it in. I looked again, nowhere to be seen. Was quite depressed, but then I was overjoyed uh, a little later when a good Samaritan <laughs> called and, and had found my, my wallet, and I was able to retrieve it today. Wow, they are still good in this world. Yes, huh? yes. But uh, it was a little sobering when I realized I had uh, <laughs> I put my wallet at the top of the car and just driven off with well, it like I that. Well, I think... I wouldn't raise the red flag just yet for you because I feel like we all have those absent-minded moments, right? Yes. I think that's something to remember for the listeners too. Like just because, oh no, I lost my keys one day, it doesn't mean you're on the road to dementia, so to speak. We all have those moments. Right. Although with losing your keys, they say if it becomes a frequent occurrence, you, it might be time to start worrying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, ultimately, you know, I think Dr. Roman, he, he gave us a lot of good uh, insight into the very various types of dementia, uh, what they look like, and then also what to look out for. And as you said, perhaps prevent moving forward. Yes. Well, I, I'm hoping he's right. All right. Well, that's going to do it for us this week on the On Health Podcast. And we encourage you all to go to our blog at houstonmethodist.org slash blog and to share, like, and subscribe to our podcast. New episodes drop Tuesday mornings. 
So until then, stay tuned and stay healthy. Houston Methodist Hospital has been named the best hospital in Texas for 11 years in a row by U.S. News and World Report. Houston Methodist Hospital is the number one hospital in Texas and number 15 in the nation. We are nationally ranked in 10 specialties, the most in the state. For more than 100 years, we have provided you the best and safest clinical care, advanced technology, and patient experience. That's our promise of leading medicine. Houston Methodist, leading medicine.